Our next speaker doesn't need a lot of introduction. So Eduardo Rami from the Thomas Jefferson University is going to be talking about the microcirculatory imaging in medical ICU. Boy, now the pressure's on, even though I preambled my disclosure that I'm not an expert in this, but thank you, Marwan. This is a great topic. And Marwan, thank you and the UT team and Herman team again. What incredible conference. Um, so these are my disclosures here, none. Um, but I do want to give a brief, in brief here, I want to tell you that Marwan challenged us to break boundaries. Not break bad, but break boundaries. And I think despite clear advances, we still have a total deficiency in a lot of patient satisfaction and survival outcomes, survival free from X. So microcirculation may be a window to perfusion. And then we, I'll show that studies demonstrate that there is clearly an uncoupling of flow to the microcirculation, which I wasn't aware the data was so strong. That's solid. That doesn't have to be debated. I'll show a little bit of that because, again, Marwan only gave me seven minutes to a topic I don't know much about, so I'll try to be brief. Summarize how microcirculation is measured and visualized and what does it mean. And finally, I'll discuss a couple neat, neat interventions that have made a difference in the market circulation. The question is, will it make a difference in outcome? That's where I'm glad there's trialist here can maybe frame the question well. So this is myocardial infarction shock. We always show this 50%, like, you know, we're always, we're always defeated that we're at 50% mortality, we're not changing things. This, this reassured me that we were wrong in saying that. I mean, there has been some, if you believe Dr. Hodgman and Atal, there has been some interventions that have helped myocardial infarction shock. And I would say that whereas the previous paradigm was hemodynamic on the flow, now we have teams, right? Sky, teams. Does that make a difference? I think so. The mortality, not randomized. I don't think you're going to randomize yet to shock teams or no shock teams unless you have sites that are way behind the curve. But the mortality seems to be doing better. Now what about the next horizon? Maybe targeted microcirculation, targeted metabolism. I'm hoping one day we're going to be able to do this for patients because we clearly have a disconnect between outcomes and what Dr. Griffith taught us, which is own the flow. So here's a macro circulatory view of things that we see every day, besides going to examine patients. Here's something that actually with Dr. Baquette and his team, this is a nice illustration that we start with the physical exam right in the middle. Then we try to get some data that's related to hemodynamic, some more fancier data has been talked about a little bit and tidal CO2. We also have some differential of carbon dioxide consumed and supplied and they're measuring that. And the question is, can we get to an even lower mortality in certain types of shock? Um, one caution, maybe for the future, Marwin, reperfusion injury. Be a great talk for someone to give. Don't give that to me, <laughs> but someone to give because I think this is another killer that nobody, I mean, what do you do about that? So direct measurement with microcirculation. Initial experience was actually with the neurologists or the neurosurgeons, more than neurosurgeons. Brain tumors. Then, so here's one of the first demonstrations of direct visualization of the microcirculation in the brain. Subarachnoid hemorrhage before and after hyperventilation. If you see in these still shots little, you know, crumbly things in the vessel, those are red cells. You shouldn't be seeing them because it, the flow should be faster. So after hypercap, after hypocapnic, hopefully hyperventilation, you're going to get the response, which is an autoregulatory drop in flow, and that was nicely demonstrated. So can we improve shock outcomes with a phenotyping of this microcirculation so we can at least achieve meaning more, meaningful survival? I have a lot of my teammates here today from Jefferson, and a lot of us are feeling a lot in terms of how we're going to try to make a difference moving forward. There's a lot of very sick patients with shock, and I think, importantly, meaningful survival is going to be hugely important. So. Can we improve it? Look, the distal limb, I'm going to call this the distal limb. Why? Because it's way at the bottom of this cascade. What does Dr. Hodgman and Atal talk about? You got all these other biomarkers, all these other processes, but you're, you end up with some vasodilatory and compensatory vasoconstrictive response, and then what happens? I think the microcirculation is confused, doesn't know what to do. <laughs> it, it, I mean, you don't have, you have an uncoupling between what we're trying to drive flow and then what the tissue perfusion is going to be. So this is what I'm going to call the distal limb of adaptation. I think that's completely confused, and I don't think we know how to intervene on that. So direct, just quick language uh, here, orthogonal polarized spectroscopy. That was the first generation direct measurement. 
Generation, uh, second generation would be side stream, dark field, SDF. I'll show an example of that. Third generation, I'm not going to get into. Again, I didn't learn a lot about this till recently, and I'm going to tell you, this is exciting because the third generation involves no film. No film. Just analytic tools that you can just go ahead and capture. So the parameters we're looking for, think about it in several ways. So one is measuring the velocity through these vessels. That's mean uh, flow rate. Another one is measuring the capillary density or the vessel density that's actually flow driven, adequate flow. So that's PCD, which is perfused capillary density. Let's just focus on those two and try to dive into the data. So here is an example of SDF, side stream dark field, that is on the left, very sluggish. I mean, you can actually see the red cells trying to go somewhere, even in the arteriolar bed, forget about the capillary. On the right, it looks better. This came from this paper, Cardiogenic Shock. It's the team from Erasmus, the thor Thorax Center team, which has done an interesting work in here. And what they've shown by doing serial patients, these are serial patients that had MI shock. You can see the algorithm there. They took about 50 of them. They were able to show a marked survival difference with what's called perfused capillary density using SDF. By quartiles, excellent. And the only perfuse capillary density and, in this case, cardiac power index, which makes sense for MI shock, were significant. Just 50 patients. I think this data was important. Now, what happens if you follow up at 24 hours? Can you do something about it? Yes. If you are low and then become high capillary density, meaning you fulfilled some, maybe by giving fluid to a cardiogenic shock patient that may be more vasodilated, might be, or maybe by doing something else you have actually made a difference and you actually have a survival advantage. Sepsis, way more than cardiogenic shock. The studies are very strong that you have this alteration of sublingual. In this case, by the way, they measured it in, under the tongue, a lot of these studies. Where you measured it is interesting. Here again, capillary density, excellent. I mean, look at the 80%, near 80% near survival in those that had basically a very high quartile of capillary density fulfilled. Here is from just 250 severe sepsis patients from DeBacher, who's a great expert in this. Look at that. I mean, look at that curve as far as being able to determine survivors or non-survivors in the baseline. And again, multivariate analysis held well. Here is another study, and I just want to show this to show one other, not just, not just the capillary density that's perfused, but the heterogeneity, not just between beds, but within that bed. Even the heterogeneity tells you something's messed up. Something's not adaptive, something's not regulated. Mechanisms, I'm actually going to go fast because I'm over time. I'm just going to say that do we have a paradigm where we, we, we know that flow is not determined by the heart. I hope a lot of people, I'm a cardiologist, but I know a lot of people really believe that this was Guyton. This is basic Guyton. Flow is determined by the metabolic demand. If you sympathetic, if you go ahead and de-enervate the heart in a dog model, which is what he did, you can generate incredible amount of uh, flow. Uh, just by basically peripheral demand input uh, in a dog. So metabolic demand drives flow. Then we have at the microvasculature, what are the mechanisms that are able to compensate for what may be a maladaptation? Because you're changing vessel tone, you're changing, and that's what these pathways are, vessel tone in pathway B, and then pathway C is a vasoconstrictive response. This is the intervention I'm just going to talk about real briefly. Nitroglycerin in septic patients, crazy. Crazy. That's why it's in Lancet. <laughs> you wanted breaking boundaries? Crazy. <laughs> Septic shock ICU patients, given crystalloid, colloid, all of these six patients were made the best they could be made as far as a CVP goal, MAP goal. A little dopamine, lowest possible dose. Catanserin, a serotonin re receptor blocker. This is, a, this is the same group, by the way, in Erasmus. Also blocked. Um, again, probably for improved microcirculation. Nitroglycerin was given a 0.5, then loaded. Here's what they saw. They actually showed that at two minutes post nitroglycerin, you improve the flow. And here is that improvement. The final thing I'm going to say is thank God for one study on mechanical circulatory support. Although I agree with Jason that ECMO needs to be studied with respect to that. At minimum, you shouldn't harm people with ECMO. Maybe you should make sure their microcirculation is intact. The good news is by improving perfusion, flow, you're actually improving microcirculation. Very small study. I don't see anything else here. So thank you. I just want to thank my colleagues. I'm not, my, my summary will be with the questions. This is our wonderful team um, at Jefferson. And I want to just thank, as an intellectual debt, my partner from Penn, Dr. Wald, and several other colleagues, and obviously Dr. Banayosi here, who I try to meet and learn from. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk, a very stimulating topic. Um, in the interest of time, can we move on uh, to the next? Uh, sure. Oh, uh, hey, go ahead. Roy. <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, we, we showed uh, a number of years ago that with an ischemia reperfusion model, uh, endothelin you know, goes up exponentially at the time of reperfusion. And that induces uh, calcium overload, A and B. Um, it also induces apoptosis. And if you give an endothelin antagonist, endothelin 2 antagonist, uh, prior to reperfusion, it's obliterated. Same thing, you get the same thing, obliteration of the endothelin response if you unload the heart just prior to reperfusion. So I think endothelin antagonists need to be pursued. And we, we've been trying to do that. We have little, very little support for it, but we're, we're going to keep going. I mean, your model, Roy, and remember, because you gave a keynote, was in the heart. You think this could be applied beyond the heart? Absolutely. Okay. The endothelin levels go all over the body. So. Someone's got to do breaking boundaries with that. Thank you.